Uh, hey, everybody. Cool. Uh, my name is Ben Sadegapur. I'm currently working at the uh, head of Hacker Education at Hacker One. Uh, most people know me as Nahamsek. Um, I've hacked a few companies like Verizon Media, who happens to be here, uh, Snapchat, Department of Defense, uh, the US Air Force, and so on. I also make a, a couple of videos on YouTube about hacking, and I also stream some of it on Sundays and Tuesdays when Twitch allows me to do it. Uh, also, a big thank you to Cody Brocious. Um, he was the original uh, co-presenter for this talk. Um, we did this at DEF CON, uh, the original talk together, and uh, we added more to it as we went to more conferences. So I want to make sure uh, he gets uh, credit for all this work, and you will see a lot of his uh, cool research in here as well. I also have Chris here. Um, I know that he has another site coming up. Uh, he currently works with Rights and Media's uh, Bug Bounty program, and he's also going to talk about SSRF and how they deal with it, and I'll let him introduce himself uh, when we get to that portion. Um, before I do get started, uh, if you got one of these emails from AWS, I apologize. Um, so when we did this talk at DEF CON, it uh, triggered an um, email from AWS. Just as a reminder, if you think you're vulnerable to any of this, um, it's not up to AWS or GCP to help you out. It's up to your developers to make sure the user input is being sanitized. Uh, so please don't go email AWS or GCP. Um, but if you got one of these, I apologize. So SSRF allows you to imagine you're you know, talking to this application. All you're seeing is this one box. But in the background, this application has access to a number of other boxes that pulls data from or communicates to. Uh, when you have an SSRF, you end up being in charge of who this company or this uh, application is speaking to. So think about it as having some sort of a browser internally with whatever that box has access to. In some uh, cases, it's only with the cloud uh, instances that's around it, depending on how it's been configured. In some other cases, it could be the actual internal network, which is a little bit worse than the first case. And we'll talk about all of those in a little bit. If you don't know about the cloud uh, metadata, just recently, after years of uh, getting owned, Amazon finally fixed this a little bit. But back before they did this, you could just hit that IP address directly. And depending on how they had configured their AWS or GCP instances, you could pull the token or, uh, in some cases, the AWS uh, secret key. So it could give you access to whatever's on that box, and you can escalate going from there. And you don't have to always do that. You can always also fetch internal files. You can uh, talk to other boxes, as I mentioned. So you can do a lot of things. If you access an old Jira instance, for example, you can uh, chain it with that and just you know, elevate your access. That work? Okay. So just a quick example of what an SSRF could be. Imagine you go to a website. It says, hey, upload your avatar. Or you can actually remotely fetch your avatar from another website. When you go to fetch the URL for your image from another website, it makes some call you know, similar to this one uh, on the back end. It makes some API call to the API host. It queries that URL and gets your image, and it saves it and does whatever it's supposed to do. In some cases, you can change that URL to things like the different protocols, including HTTP and HTTPS, where you can query other websites. And if you're very lucky and it's very straightforward, you can actually just give it file, Etsy password, and it would pull up Etsy password as expected. But it's not always this straightforward, and there are some things that you have to deal with when it comes down to SSRF. So some CV examples. Uh, this is a very, very popular one. Uh, unfortunately, for some companies, I still see this happening to this day. I think this is now two, three years old, and we still see it happening. Um, this is for Jira. As I mentioned, like the earlier example that I had, very straightforward. All you have to do is change the consumer URI um, parameter. And for this case, uh, it's pointed to Google, and it loads Google on the box server side instead of on your browser. Um, and you can verify that by you know, either popping an XSS or just sending it to your box and seeing where the IP is coming from. And of course, you can change that to the metadata instance. And for this one, uh, Alyssa Herrera, one of our uh, top hackers on HackerOne did this to the Department of Defense. And just to show a POC, because it's a Department of Defense, she just queried for the internal host name for that box. Uh, again, it doesn't always have to be the metadata key, but you also have that option when it comes down to it. There is uh, the CVE uh, 2018, uh, that's a lot of numbers. Uh, this one is on Jenkins. <laughs> um, same kind of concept. Uh, this was done by Orange Sai. He presented this. Uh, at Black Hat, not this year, the year before. Same exact concept. When you query and change the um, URI right there, it says API URI. In the source for that page, it shows you the content of whatever host or uh, IP you have fetched for. 
So in this case, he's just fetching the AWS metadata, and it comes back with the results in the source. So it doesn't show it to you in the actual page. You just have to right-click, view source, and look for it. Um, this is not as common. A lot of uh, people have caught on that Jenkins should not be externally accessible. But in some cases, that for some reason it's externally accessible, you can still do this uh, or chain it with another bug. Uh, again, like I said, it's not always straightforward. Um, sometimes you're going to have to figure out uh, how to expel data from this, whether it's to use JavaScript or find a bypass of some sort. There's always something. Uh, again, it's not always hard, but in, people are learning about SSRF. It's becoming very more popular, and more companies are learning how to, how to uh, deal with it. So let's talk about some problems. Um, the first one is the metadata or the internal IP that you want to query for is, you know, some filtering is happening on the back end. No matter what you do, it doesn't work because they're literally matching that string of IP address to whatever you're giving it. In that case, you can make your own custom domain, point it to that IP address, query your domain, and it works. Um, that's one of the bypasses we have seen. Uh, sometimes there's only a whitelist. Uh, you can look at, for an open redirect. If you watch Louis talk, he mentioned uh, how people get pissed off when it comes down to bug bounties and they say, don't burn your open redirects. Great example of it right here. If you find an open redirect, don't report it, please. Let somebody else report it. Let somebody find an SSRF and take care of it. Um, it's $100 versus $10,000. Don't burn open redirects, please. I'm begging you. Uh, next one is, uh, there is an SSRF. You can make some sort of a connection, but the API comes back with true, false, whatever uh, result, but it doesn't show you the exact response from that page. But it allows you to use JavaScript. So we can use JavaScript to expel data. And we'll give some examples of that in a little bit, too. Um, some things that are very, very uh, valuable when it comes down to SSRF is number one thing that I personally look for is the user agent. I don't care about anything else but the user agent, because based on the user agent, my way of attacking this box, ch box changes. If it's headless Chrome, I know what I have to deal with, versus a Go uh, library, for example. So keep that in mind. The first thing you want to get is user agent. That's very important. Um, XSS in the application, if you want to burn those for a small amount of bounty, fine by me. But always remember, if there is some sort of a PDF generator on that website that actually allows you to uh, include your XSS payload from the application to the PDF, that's very valuable because you can execute JavaScript server-side and also redirect it to other stuff. And I'll show that in a little bit as well. Um, there are a ton of different tricks you can do. Redirection is huge. I mentioned it earlier. It doesn't have to be a domain. You can literally point it uh, to a PHP file, and that PHP file will um, redirect it and kind of give you a bypass. So that's a very cool trick to know. Also, any customization with HTML and CSS, where it allows you to customize the header of a PDF file, very, very vulnerable and very, very valuable. And I don't think a lot of people look for those. And again, I'm going to say this one last time. Open redirects are very valuable. Uh, keep that in mind. So let's talk about PDF generation process. Um, there are a ton of different ways you can do it. The WKHTML PDF is very one of the first ones that I've seen, very common. And then the second most common one is the Headless Chrome, um, which also does PDF generation. Uh, you can look those up, both of them. Um, they have great documentation on them. Um, again, these are not the only options. There are a ton of different ones. There are a ton of libraries. Uh, Go has some new ones that are very cool. Ruby has some. And, uh, one of the ones that we dealt with was Wheezy Print that we have never heard of. That was a very fun one to play with. Um, so those are not your only two options, and that's why I say the user agent is very valuable. You want to understand what you're going against. And sometimes the source code for those things could be open sourced, or there's some great documentation like uh, Headless Chrome does. And as I mentioned, uh, Wheezy Print is a great example of a library that just takes an HTML, no matter what it is, and it puts it into a PDF and spits it out to the user. So if you get some sort of an HTML injection in Wheezy Print or that PDF generator that's just taking an HTML and putting it to PDF, you're in luck. So keep that in mind. Um, PDF generators are a thing that a lot of developers don't think about when it comes down to rendering things. They think just because the application itself is protected, it could be the case for the PDF generator as well. But there's been a number of times where I can find an XSS anywhere on the website but I go and export it to a PDF, and it works in the PDF generator itself. Uh, so don't give up if you can't find an XSS on the app. Always rely on the PDF generator uh, to do that for you. So I talked about XSS in PDF files. Uh, let's talk about why they are valuable. Uh, again, when you get an XSS on uh, the PDF itself, you can do a ton of things when JavaScript comes into play. You can redirect, you can fetch files, um, whatever that is. So how does it work? 
Um, as I mentioned, you notice that there is some sort of an HTML. I usually just put a giant H1 tag in test123 and I underline it, whatever, so I can recognize it myself. When I go to the PDF generator and I generate it, it shows a giant test123 underlined. Um, the next step is to have it connect to your web server that you have. Like for this case, I just have it hit 443 with an iframe. And that kind of leaks a couple of information for me. First of all, the IP address that comes for it, um, it shows that it's not my IP, it's some you know, AWS box or something that the company is using. And the second one and the most important one is the user agent that kind of gives you what you're going against and what stuff to try. And sometimes it's super easy, just point the iframe to the metadata instance. And because they have not done any filtering, it just pulls up the key and gives you the data that you want. Again, it's not always this easy, but I've seen it happen more than a handful of times. So let's talk about styling and how you can get XSS in a PDF um, by just escaping the style tag. Um, so one of the things that we came across with um, this company that we're hacking on allowed us to uh, generate invoices. Um, we went through the entire application. We found a ton of XSS. Uh, unfortunately, the XSS would work on the application, so there was no sanitization on the app. When you would go to the PDF generator, somehow they figured out that this is bad. It shouldn't have XSS in there. Um, but what they forgot about was that they allow users to customize the headers. So that means changing the font color for your company name or adding uh, you know, your company's name to it, changing the font, font size, whatever that is. Um, so what we did is we sent a request to, to, just to confirm it. As you can see for the font right here, it's one of the font names right here. And we added style just to close it expecting it to leak whatever is coming after the style from the CSS. And once we generate the PDF, we can see that everything else that was after that font name uh, was getting leaked right here. So that was a good indication that, okay, they're not sanitizing their um, CSS and the user data is coming with it to um, kind of make the custom headers for the invoice. So what do we do next? Um, easy, we just, again, we made it fetch something from our server. Uh, we had to make uh, a connection to get an image. And when that came in, the only thing that we cared about was to make sure we know what the user agent was, because based on that user agent, there was different things we can do. But unfortunately for them, it was way too easy. We just closed the style tag, gave it an iframe, generate the PDF, and bam, there was their AWS keys. Um, straightforward, um, again, still happens. Um, sometimes it's not that easy. You may just have to do, again, like the redirect thing. Um, there was a time where I couldn't get this website to hit anything that I wanted to internally, but for some reason, the redirect was the key to do it. Um, it's always good to test all those things. So you want to make a checklist in your head to know, okay, if A doesn't work, I'm moving on to this thing. You want to have that uh, flow of uh, SSRF in your head to go up from uh, iframe to redirect to uh, JavaScript and so on. So you want to have that mental checklist when it comes down to it. Um, so there's other examples. You can just redirect it to directly and so on. WYSIWYG is the most exciting one um, because this was actually finally fixed. At DEF CON, they told us this was a functionality, not a bug. But I think uh, last month, they took that back after all the cons that we presented this at. And everyone said, how is that not a um, bug? We don't understand why the way it worked. Like, we don't know why they were doing this. Uh, but they finally fixed it, and this, uh, we can talk about it. So again, uh, we found this another uh, application. And hopefully, this will get disclosed. Uh, soon. This application, again, gives us an uh, invoice. You go PDF. Um, and what you do is you just put an HTML tag. We downloaded it. HTML was in there. Cool. It worked. But we couldn't get anything to actually uh, load on this PDF generator. So the way WYSIWYG worked on the back end, um, again, WYSIWYG is open source. So once we pulled the user header, we knew what to look for. So we looked up for WYSIWYG. I did a whole video on this. If you're interested in the technicality of all of it, it's on YouTube. But to make it short, WYSIWYG takes the uh, HTML template, throws the user data in there, spits out a PDF. And we tried all these different tags um, before we had access to the source code, before we even thought about looking it up. And this is what it turned into. So the H1 tag worked. Uh, the new lines worked. The iframe didn't work. Uh, it didn't get the image for a fade icon, I believe. Um, yeah, it didn't work. Oh, it did work, actually. Sorry, it worked right here. Uh, and then iframe didn't work at all. And that was a moment when we didn't, you know, all the tricks that we wanted to work with wasn't working. And um, JavaScript also was another problem. There was no JavaScript enabled at all. So there's pretty much nothing to do. So again, we tried image. We tried even embed files in there, objects. But there is this thing in the source. If you go to, um, I think it's called html.py, that's still up there. 
I think they re-implemented how they use it. But there was a link that allowed you to attach files to the PDF. Um, so if you did link rail attachments and the source for it was Etsy password, it would attach the content of Etsy password into the metadata for the PDF and not a PDF itself. So that means if I would open the PDF uh, by itself, it wouldn't show me the content. And we only figured this out because uh, Cody accidentally attached a movie to this and it took a very long time for it to attach and then the PDF was like four gigs. Um, and when we looked at our history, we realized like he did the wrong file and the file size got huge. Um, so when we did SC password, it gave us the contents of password, but that wasn't the only thing. We also realized that we can actually make uh, HTTP or HTTPS requests. So not only we could get local files, we could actually talk to other systems within that network and it would dump the entire <laughs> response for it into the metadata and using um, a Zlib, we're able to just dump all of that data from uh, the PDF into our um, box. So that kind of gave us access to uh, the keys of the kingdom, pretty much. And hopefully, again, um, the company that got owned by this, I hope you're here. I know you're here. I hope you let me disclose this soon. They're working on it, um, so look out for that. Um, so let's talk about DNS rebinding. Um, this one was a big oopsie on uh, Google's part. Uh, we didn't know this was actually a Google O-Day until they told us that we found it. Um, so the way it worked is you would make a, with JavaScript, you make a request to the user metadata. It wouldn't work. But if you load the site again, um, change the DNS records for uh, X, it would actually work. But there is a very small trick to it. And uh, we didn't make any sense of it until uh, Google told us <laughs> what we did. Um, so the browser loads the website. And the script sends a message to the server and it says rebind that uh, subdomain x.ploit.info to 169. The script resolves A0 through A2499 because that's how many requests it takes for, to flush the DNS for headless Chrome. Then the script requests the data from the metadata service using the request to x.ploit.info, which is actually now pointed to the GCP metadata instance. And then all the data from that uh, endpoint would be sent to our server using JavaScript. We didn't know this was actually a problem. On, we thought this was actually on Snapchat, and I'll show the demo for it. We thought this was an implementation, implementation on Snapchat's end, because if you ever want to talk to GCP, there are a couple of headers you need. We didn't have those headers in our request. But somehow doing the rebinding and bypassed the entire thing and gave us access to GCP. And Eduardo was actually the person that came to us and told us, like, hey, just so you know, like, this is the one case where the user isn't wrong. We actually didn't know this existed. Um, and I think Cody uh, just was sending a ton of requests at some point. I don't think he was counting how many he was sending. It was a just large number of requests, and it worked. And then eventually, we uh, minimized the number of requests until we got the right number, which was 2,499 requests before it uh, flushes it. So this is the, and hopefully it works. Cool. So this is the, um, vulnerability that we did, uh, just like I explained, it was on Snapchat. You go to Snapchat, they, you can make these cool filters if you use them. That's how it's made. Uh, you go in there, uh, for some reason, you could actually make an entire web page into one of these. All you had to do was give it the URL for the page that you wanted to put in here. So for this one, we put Google. And this is kind of what the requests look like, just sitting Google right there. And um, we decided to point that to the server where we're rebinding the record to switch on the 2500 request. So when you hit that, it would make this request, it would get hooked, and it would loop through, I think, 30 times with a bunch of like 500 requests or 50 requests at a time. After a short 10 minutes of waiting, which feels like a longer than 10 minutes while you're hacking, but finally gave us the tokens and we put this to Snapchat and lucky for us, um, we found this also in the developer instance that had access to more stuff. Um, so it's good to know, good to identify different places where you can do this. So in Prod, they didn't have access to a lot of stuff based on what they told us, but we identified another dev instance that was used internally that the token had access to internal stuff. So it's always good to not just exploit in prod, if they allow you to go in other areas, it's always good to identify those as well.
so let's talk about um, HTML injection to SSRF and uh, finally giving an XXC in the PDF generator. So a lot of times when you are working with SSRF, um, you might get some sort of an HTML injection in there, but JavaScript might not work, uh, or there's some uh, stuff that I've put in place that might stop you from exploiting it. So I came across this on another uh, website that I was hacking on. I pretty much tried any book that I had off my sleeve, any trick that I had in my uh, sleeve. No iframe, no redirects, no XSS, but no problem because um, the image tag would work, but the, it would only fetch an image from my website, which leaked the user agent for what they were using, which is Prince version 10. And just Googling that by itself gave me the CVE number, and it turned out another hacker, uh, Corbin Leo, uh, known as CDL, had already done this and did an entire analysis on it. I didn't have to, have to do the work. All I had to do was understand how he did it. And lucky for me for this slide, he actually had a video of it. Um, all you had to do was point the iframe to an XML file, if you're not familiar with XXC, uh, I would re recommend going to the OWASP uh, page for it, but it allows you to do similar stuff. You can fetch files, uh, internal host, whatever that is. By doing that, you just convert the PDF, uh, hits that XML, and this is what's in the XML itself. It pretty much just um, calls for that metadata instance and the endpoint for it and gives you the API token keys for it. So again, this is I wanted to stress out how important it is to have the user agent. If I didn't look for the user agent throughout this research, I would have not had this exploit at all. So always keep that in mind. Uh, always look for a um, user agent plus SSRF, bug bounty, whatever that is, you'll always find someone has done some sort of research on it. Now, this is a bonus slide. Uh, I kind of threw this as a bonus. It didn't really turn into be a SSRF. We were playing with this thing for days, I want to say, and we didn't get to exploit it until we realized that there is other ways you can uh, attack PDF generators when it comes down to uh, security. <laughs> Um, the first thing was that we did was we put in the HTML tag, it worked. Um, nothing else outside of that would work. No iframe, none of it to localhost worked. But what was strange was it was actually doing this templating thing. And this one would actually, um, with the math would actually be done. And when we looked into this, um, I think this was a, a Java backend, I could be wrong, but um, we were trying to just throw a Java payload to see if it works, but it turned out it's just easy. You didn't have to think about templatizing it. You can just simply put your uh, command within your template. So instead of saying seven times seven, you can actually just put in uh, your payload, whatever the um, RCE payload is, and it will return the results of that command. And I'll show that in a sec. And the only way we figured that out was just to figure out what the class name was for. Actually, Zayat um, Brett was also one of the top hackers at Hacker One. Um, he's the one that dumped this, and then we realized that we're just approaching this completely wrong. So it's not always SSRF that comes out with PDF generators. They're very, very popular with PDF generators. But there's always other ways of doing it. ERV injection is one, XXC is another one. And I kind of want to showcase this so people don't just uh, get tunnel vision on SSRF. There's always other things to consider. So what we did was we just sent it, um, if you guys remember that last one that I showed earlier with the styling thing, the exact same thing in the styling uh, of the site, it let us close it out and we threw our payload for LS and uh, it gave us the directory listing for that application when it got rendered in the PDF. And that gave us a little bit of money. Uh, SSRF tools, um, we did a lot of work for SSRF for this talk. Um, two tools came out of it. This one is SSRF. Uh, this is a rebind for it. So if you want to um, do the same stuff as we did for the Snapchat case, this is on GitHub. It's open source uh, code. Is, it's on Dakin's uh, repository on GitHub. Uh, it does all the stuff that I talked about. We just did automated. We, we already had the tool. Might as well just give it to other hackers to get it and see if they can export other applications with it. The next one is SSRF test. This one just fires through a bunch of payloads that we've given it, things that have worked with us, things that we think is important as a hacker to do when it comes down to SSRF. You can either use his instance of SSRF, uh, SSRFtest.com. It's the same exact thing as that, um, the open source tool. Or you can install it on your own um, and check it out and see if you can export any of these SSRFs. I'll give it up for, uh, to Chris to talk about how they work with hackers to identify uh, SSRFs. So we, we've seen a lot of SSRF folks over the years that our program has existed, but it's become a lot more popular in the past handful of months. Probably thanks a lot to Ben and the work that he's been doing with everyone else in the bug bounty world. Um, 
So we've we've had at at Bug Bounty at Fire Me and Holly Jack Safe Harbor. I gotta put that in there. Um, we're the oh, parents. This is doing it. Our, our team, our security team, is called Paranoids, and our, our mission is protecting uh, consumer, corporate, and customer data. Um, I'm a soft, software engineer by trade, security consultant by accident, and um, I got into bug bounty also by accident because I like solving interesting problems. So back back to the SSRF thing, though, um, we we classify it in in four different ways. Ben mentioned that open redirects are a gateway to SSRF. Um, what? Please don't burn them. <laughs> don't burn them. Yeah, so, and we, we love seeing that because we know that they're, it, it's, it's indicative of some other problem, right? It's easy to fix, they're easy to catch, but it's indicative of something worse. And that's, that's when you get at 301, 302, redirect back to the client. Sometimes people call them a client-side SSRF, um, it, which is not really accurate. Uh, but they they're, tend to be all over the place and pretty innocuous. Unless you go a little deeper and you get something like a blind SSRF where you're able to get back some sort of error, true, false based response, like a blind SQL injection or you know, there's blind cross-site scripting. There's blind varieties of all sorts of attacks where you get a true, false kind of response. In the case of SSRFs, it's usually a 401, 404, type swapping where if, it, if the resource you're requesting exists, you'll get a 401 not authorized versus a 404 not found if it doesn't exist. Um, and usually, you know, the next step is a content-based attack where you're a, the target system that you're uh, attacking, right, is, is able to request information from another victim server, but it's limited to a particular content type. So it's working with XML system or it's working with uh, a JSON system. So it only gets that specific content type back. Um, and then that it, it'll only respond to you with that certain data set. So if it's a JSON based thing, you can only get JSON content. And then finally, you've got the full SSRF. It's not content restricted. It's whatever file on the system for, for a local SSRF. It's whatever resource inside the network. Um, maybe even different network segments, which is where we get into how we identify impact when we're looking at bugs. So first thing is, is to classify it as what type of SSRF are we looking at? And then we want to define what is the impact of this SSRF bug. In our network, this is not really our network diagram, but you get the idea where we have everything out that exists. There's a lot of stuff there. There's stuff that exists in production. The dev is somewhere, you know, maybe up here. And then the, the office corporate network is people's laptops and the, the box that you bought that's sitting on your desk that acts kind of like a dev machine and you have play stuff on there and whatever. But you have that sort of pyramid. So we built a couple of, a, a single server that we deployed all over the place. And it's just a simple Nginx server that we give it all sorts of different file types and it just serves these files whenever you request it. There's no questions asked. You want a file, here you go. We name them with very obvious names. JSON format has JSON 001, JSON 002. There's like four or five different ones. And we have three, four dozen different file types. Whenever someone asks, hey, I've got a thing that I think only exists with .odt files, sure, we'll put that on there, whatever. I don't care. It's easy to do. And then we can redeploy the box to all the places it's set. So we put this in production. We put it in corp. We put it in data centers over here and data centers over there. And the box that sits on my desk at my office, which is in Corp, and then we sit it wherever we have network locations in, in the different layers, but also different geolocations, because sometimes that matters. You might be able to get an SSRF in a particular data center where the victim exists, but ACLs on the network layer don't let you go from data center to data center, even inside the same zone. So we call this the banana stand, because if you've seen uh, Arrested Development, there's always money in the banana stand because if you can get to one of these servers and you fetch one of these pieces of content, we know that you've found an SSRF and that's valuable to us. So how do we prove that? Well, we need, we've got excellent logging on these things. So it sends me an email every 15 minutes and everyone on the team gets it. And you know, whenever we, someone starts playing with SSRFs, we start getting pings and we know someone's testing and part of that process is we ask people to hit 
I don't know, slash username so that we can identify, hey, you've been playing around with it, Ben's been playing around with it right now in our system, and he got something. And you know, we'll wait for a report to come in. Sometimes we go talk to someone and say, hey, you got something, did you know what you found? Sometimes yes, most of the time yes. So sometimes no. Um, but then you know, we, we ask for, bug bounty is all about proving what you did, right? If, if we have to track you down, that's not as valuable to us because you don't know probably that it happened. If you know that you, had, that you got into to the system, then uh, you're gonna submit a report and that's gonna be worth a lot of money. You know, you know that. Um, so you know, that, that's why we ask for. Tag yourself in, in, this is just one of the clips from the email. So we get your IP and that's, that's my phone when I tested it. Um, you know, and I hit the, the, whatever. It just shows up, it's easy. But we get these alerts all the time uh, when, when people are testing it. And our internal scanners pick it up because it's an open box on the network and you know, these logs fill up and that's annoying. But it's easy, it's very easy to track down. That's an internal IP, we just go look that up in our database and figure out that's one of our scanners at the time, drop the alert, that's fine. So then there's what it looks like when you tag your username and obviously iPhone, I'm using iPhone. Big surprise. So that's, that's, how, that's how we're testing, or that's how we're, we're catching SSRFs at, at Verizon Media. Ben? Um, we'll do a quick recap. Uh, again, the reason why we wanted to do this together was to, if you have a huge presence online and you have a ton of uh, different network layers, you want to allow hackers to do this the right way. You don't want them to hit the wrong endpoint and cause more work for you guys. Um, so if, you have, if you're dealing with a bug bounty program, I highly recommend setting up these instances. It minimizes the impact for you guys and also allows the hackers to uh, kind of figure out what they can play with. And there is that bridge between the two teams, uh, the hackers and the bug bounty programs. Um, so again, SSRFs could be very dangerous. Um, don't give up on your bugs. The Wheezy print bug that I talked about took us about three months to finally figure out. Um, it took us like a trip to New York to finally understand how this worked when we're both together in the same place. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, collaboration is a big thing. If it wasn't for collaborating with Daken or Zayed, some of those bugs wouldn't have happened and vice versa. We wouldn't have uh, known they existed. Uh, if you see a PDF generator somewhere, I want to say nine out of 10 times, don't quote me, but nine out of 10 times that I've hacked on him, that have either been vulnerable in the past or they're still vulnerable. Um, so always keep a lookout for PDF generators or anything that could, even a, a PNG generator, like an image generator. Uh, depending on what the back end is, uh, it could be vulnerable to SSRF. Also chain your bugs, XSS. Uh, I won't say anything about open redirect, but keep that in mind. Um, if you're blocked off, uh, go look for an open redirect. It might be very helpful. Um, disable JavaScript, I don't know why you would need it. If you don't need it, why put it in there for people to use? Um, create some good whitelisting. Uh, I know it's hard, uh, but do your best. It would uh, minimize the impact. Configure your cloud instances, minimize the impact of what those tokens or keys could access. Um, just disable it if you can, if you don't need it. And also be nice to hackers. Um, we just want to hack stuff. Um, and again, a big thank you to Orange, Sai, Alyssa, Shubs, Zai, Daken, CDL for uh, doing all the research they did and letting me use some of their work in this talk. And that's all I have. Is there any questions? Uh, when it comes to AWS and the metadata, how does the V2 metadata change a lot of the examples that you showed? I'm gonna let you talk to that if you know. <laughs> I haven't tested anything new with the new AWS instances. Um, the only thing that I know is that the two protocols have to match. So if you're on HTTPS, you have to also hit HTTPS on the metadata. But I haven't played at all, at all with it. Well, so for the yeah. I think uh, AWS is a very big uh, exclusion to this now because this, the, the, the new changes went in effect, I think, a month ago or so. Um, so we haven't came across any new SSRFs that have been on AWS, but if I do find out, that'll be a talk for next year. <laughs> cool. Um, so I'm just curious about the banana stand setup that you have. So presumably you have to have that open for every service to access, but if you have services which you like block down so they can only access one thing, do you then open it up so that it can access that one thing and also the banana stand, or like how do you resolve that? Uh, no. So if if a server, if a service is locked down, it should only be able to access a set of known, like a whitelist, right? 
then if it can access the banana stand, that list is broken. So that's proof that the SSRF exists. We're not doing any extra openings to force the banana stand to be accessible. It's, it's entirely open in the network segments that it exists in, in all the data centers that it exists in. So whenever it gets hit, if it's not one of our scanners, it's coming from the outside, we know that someone has found a way in because it's pivoted off of one of our, one of our systems. Right, so in theory, an application could have an SSRF, but you have a firewall restriction, which then gets dropped at some later point, which would then open it up. And so you kind of, if you keep scanning, you might, you might catch it. So yeah. don't give up. Yeah, that's exactly. And that's the, that's the entire point of it, is that it is that, that intentional honeypot, so that you know when you've gotten in because of the, the response that you get, one of the files that you know you're looking for, you know, there's no question of what am I going after. It's like the AWS metadata. There's a known quantity that you can request. Um, these are the known files. We publish that on our, on our policy page because we don't want people, it's, it's dangerous for you, it's dangerous for us um, if you're just rooting around the network, right? That can cause havoc and break things. Whereas if you just jump in the honeypot, then that's safe, it's playground, it's found, right? Yeah. So uh, you keep on, uh, you know, banging on the point, don't, uh, don't burn your open redirects, don't burn your open redirects, right? But when you report, when if you've escalated to an SSRF, don't you inherently burn the open redirect because it's in your report? It's like, that's how I got to the SSRF. But that's the point, right? Like, you want to make sure you're using it for a good cause. Okay. <laughs> the, a lot of times when... Don't just go for the low-hanging fruit for the open right. redirect and just try to keep trying to escalate yeah. again. If you find open redirect, like, sure, report it, but try other things before you just jump the gun and say, I'm going to report this for a quick bucks, right? It's a quick $100 uh, bounty. Versus you find somewhere, may, maybe the CSRF, the SSRF maybe has a whitelisting that only that domain works, and if they've already fixed that redirect from a month ago, you kind of screwed yourself. Mm -hmm. um, versus giving them a chain of bugs together. There's one more right here. All right, I guess this is a uh, Chris question. So if I'm understanding correctly, the banana stand is a specific requirement in the rules of engagement, I would guess. Am I extrapolating correctly? Uh, yeah, so we, we opened it up as just, it was a service that we were providing to yeah. make it easier to identify that you have succeeded in SSRF. And that proved successful enough that we turned it into a rules of engagement type thing where if you're reporting an SSRF in our systems, but not able to show impact, you're, you're not able to access the banana stand, then <coughs> it's not really necessary. There's something different going on there. And that triggers us to go figure out you know, we have to go dive deeper in that, but um, there, because there's no restrictions on it, it's not going to be an actual SSR attack. There's something different going on there, so it's not going to be a full ten, fifteen thousand dollar bounty. It'll be less than that, based on the other bug. And as a hacker, for me, it's easier to like know what to look for versus have to brute force for internal IPs to see which one comes back, what port it's on. Just hitting whatever they have given me is just easier. So I'm not breaking anything. I'm not worried about any. Uh, problems or brute forcing at all. I just go and see, okay, what kind of files can I fix? Is it JPEG? Is it an HTML? And sort of that kind of stuff. I think it's a, it's a bridge between hackers and security teams. Yeah, when I, when I was first hearing it described, it sounded, um, I might have just missed a piece of it. It sounded a lot more like it was almost like a honeypot, but then I realized as we were going through the rest of the conversation that no, this is actually a deliberate setup um, where you're specifically telling um, uh, researchers, hey, um, if you think you have something, you gotta go for this thing that's the indication that, like, that's the indication to us, the, the affirmation to us that you've validly found something. Yeah, I used the word honeypot, but pot of gold is more yeah. accurate. Honeypot, yeah. pot. Pot. there you go. <laughs> Quite copyrighted. <laughs> Pen pending. Pen pending. <laughs> Back to the banana stand again. Um, do you monitor uh, DNS requests or DNS query to see, like, if people have, like, just a firewall issue, but they still get the server to, like, do a DNS resolution for the host? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe we, we have that logging. It doesn't get dumped into the, auto, the email system that we get. Um, but if someone was able to find that piece of it and send in a report, mm -hmm. we would go look for those logs and we'd have them. Cool. Um, it's just not that quick 30 second look in my email yeah. kind of validation. Um, Ooh, that's a good question. Haddix on the other way in the end. 
do you find SSRF mostly with HTTP and HTTPS protocols, or are you finding it across the board, across other protocols like FTP and other sensitive services that you might expose? I've, um, I've only seen SSH once <laughs> that worked. The Telnet ones, those are the, the golden ones that I've seen. Um, but mostly it is against HTTP. A lot of times when I'm querying a file, it's not directly by going file, you know, dot, dot, slash, slash, whatever that is. Like, it's not that. It's just me redirecting. I think people have caught on to, like, not allowing the other protocols to work. They rely on HTTP or HTTPS. But again, depending on how you have configured it, there's a ton of different attacks, uh, vectors that come with it. I, I've, I've written some internal guidance for our teams about how to, how to protect against, against SSRFs. And in general, you could answer it by just being able to definitively answer the question, when I go to make a request from the server as, as the host to something else, um, answer the question, is this thing that I'm going to ask for an internal system or an external system? The secondary question is, if it's internal, is this a whitelist approved thing? If it's external, I probably don't care because it's just an open redirect and let the user deal with that. Right? Um, but being able to answer the question, is this an internal system, can be very difficult in, in certain cases. So. A lot of times, um, I answer that question by asking myself, so what? Like, so what I can access this? Or so what I can access this file type? And if you can't answer the so what, then you're probably doing it the wrong way. So that so what is very, very important to ask yourself. I can access this thing. So what? What can I do with it? Yep. Cool. Thanks again. Cool. Thanks, guys. Could we have another round of applause? <laughs>